Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Lots of discussion in today's show about life and how we feel about life and love and loss. Psychologist and philosopher Dr. Robert Solomon thinks that our emotions can hold the key to meaning, like the meaning of life. And I know that you and I are wary of emotions when it comes to manipulation, trusting feelings over facts. That's not really what I'm talking about. Emotions are a huge and healthy part of what makes us human beings. It's good to feel something about the things we think about, to feel love for other people, pride in something we've accomplished, shame for doing wrong, and even fear when that fear keeps us from getting hurt. We evolved to feel. Dr. Solomon's series is called Passions, Philosophy, and the Intelligence of Emotions. It's a wonderful resource that you can enjoy for free right now at The Great Courses Plus. And if you're looking for something a little different, you ought to check out Dr. David Christian's Big History, The Big Bang, Life on Earth, and the Rise of Humanity. It's sort of the history of everything. The Great Courses Plus streams right into your life, your computer, tablet, phone, via the Great Courses Plus app. Thousands of lectures on so many wonderful subjects. Start your journey with The Great Courses Plus today. Your future self will thank you. Sign up with my special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. When you go there, you will get a 14-day trial with unlimited access for free. So go now to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. I've got an observation. I just want to throw this out. You tell me if I'm close. If you've ever felt this or observed this in your own life. But you have a friend or a family member, somebody who's in your life, somebody you love. And they have in their life some kind of object that has almost no intrinsic value. It's not really worth anything. It's not the kind of thing you could ever resell. It's probably cheap when they bought it. You know, driving down the street in their car and they hung something from the mirror, the rear view mirror. Maybe it's a necklace or I don't know, fuzzy dice. I don't care. I mean, whatever it is. And uh, they thought it was kind of fun and cool, and they stick it in the car, and they're hanging it from the mirror. And so when you get in their car, you sort of associate that with them. They pull up in the driveway to pick you up to go somewhere, and you just see it hanging from the mirror. Oh, look, there's the necklace that they bought at a gift shop for four ninety nine. That is a reflection of whatever they're interested in. Maybe it's a you know a Star Trek emblem because they're a sci fi geek or maybe it's like a, a treble clef or something because they are a musician or a little violin they're a violinist i don't care what it is it's a reflection of them worthless in terms of monetary value but it's hanging from the mirror you go to their house and you see that they've got like a bookshelf and then they've got a little section with albums like old school vinyl albums their favorite bands from whatever decade The album came out of. They hardly ever pull the thing out and play it. You couldn't sell it on eBay for a buck and a half, right? It's just there and it's valuable to them, but it's not really valuable. Not really. It's just there. They got a favorite coffee mug. When you go see them, they're always drinking their coffee out of this cheap ass mug that they just like the way it feels in their hands. It makes the coffee taste better for them. You just associate this $10 mug with this person. 
There's an old ratty t-shirt. They've had it for 15 years. Won't throw it away. It's too nasty to wear outside. They just wear it around the house. It's part of their home uniform. It's worthless, but it's part of their lives. It's something that they really assigned value to. That kind of thing. Have you noticed that when your loved one dies, those things all of a sudden become collector's items? All of a sudden, they become valuable. Have you noticed that? You reach out and you grab onto it because it is a piece of the person that you lost. After the funeral, as they're going through their possessions, somebody calls and says, Hey, look, I know you always kind of like this necklace that was hanging from the rearview mirror. I think they would want you to have it. Would you like to take this? And you say, Yes, absolutely. And maybe you hang that necklace the way they did in your car from the rearview mirror. Hey, I know you don't have a record player, but uh, would you like this album that uh, was in their bookshelf? You know, we're going through their favorite records and uh, thought you might want it. And you're like, absolutely, give it to me. I don't have a way to play it, but you think I'll go buy a record player or maybe I'll just keep it. Maybe I'll frame it. Maybe I can just sort of put it in my home somewhere so I can look up and have fond memories of the music that they loved. You need any coffee mugs? Would you like uh, to take this coffee mug? I don't even drink coffee. Please give me the mug. I mean, our whole perception changes about the supposedly insignificant pieces of the lives of our loved ones. What changes? They become these tokens, these icons. They are attached to the person, the personality, the identity, the memory of those who have been stripped away from us, and we miss them, and we yearn for them, and we'll just grasp for any piece of them that we can get, and then when we get them, we cherish them ourselves and hold on to them. How about old furniture? I mean, daddy's old rocking chair is the kind of thing that comes to mind, which I know it happens, but it sounds a little cliche when I say it, like a country song. But, I mean, it's that kind of thing. Here's an example. Natalie's father passed away a few years ago. They didn't have a good relationship. He kind of disappeared from her life when she was very young. Her stepdaddy became her daddy, right? And then he appeared when she was in her 30s and I think was trying to patch things up as best he could, given the limited tool set that he had. He was trying to, if he couldn't be daddy, to at least be her father. And they began to reestablish a relationship. And he passed away a few years ago, and she was at his side. And she has his old bedroom dresser in a guest room upstairs. And the thing totally clashes with everything else in the room. It's that old school 70s kind of a orange-brown wood stain. The style of the dresser is just like it came out of a time capsule kind of thing. It doesn't really work. If you were to look at it objectively, it doesn't match all the other kind of modern pieces that we have in the room. And yet the piece stays, and Natalie has great affection for it. It makes her feel good. Why? Because it represents the somewhat rebuilt relationship with the father that she had lost. I think for her, it's an emblem of how they had begun to sort of reestablish some kind of relationship before he died. And she takes comfort in having the piece in the house. Try to put it on eBay and sell it. You might get 50 bucks for it, maybe. But the value for her is a totally different thing that has nothing to do with money. Do you know what that's about? I mean, do you feel that about anything that you possess from somebody you lost or somebody you knew, some object that has become for you a collector's item? Do you have anything like that? I think, you know, this assigning a value explains why some people become kind of awful whenever... A loved one passes away and their estate is now in play. Come on, we've all got a story. We know somebody. Maybe we were directly involved. Grandma died. And now we're going through her attic and she's got this and she's got this and she's got this and she's got this. Who's going to get it? Well, in the will, 
She said this, but wait a minute, I want that, I will contest the will. Or it wasn't in the will, it's just sort of out there in a box, now we're going to scrap for it. Now people who were previously a big happy family, all of a sudden when it came to this object, it's a cage match. They're going after each other. They're sneaking into the house when nobody's there, just to get it, and abscond with it and hide it in their own attics, because this is mine, grandma would have wanted me to have have this. I can think of a specific scenario. Somebody passed away. One of the daughters of the man who passed away, when nobody was there, nobody was looking, before they had a chance to actually organize anything, she just snuck into the house and took what she wanted. Didn't give a shit about anybody else. Now, I don't know if that was about sentimental value or maybe it was about, I'm just going to get what's mine because it's free. I mean, you never know about people. There's a lot of gears in that machine. I mean, when toxic people find an opportunity to get into somebody's personal effects, furniture, assets, bank accounts, whatever, yeah, all bets are off, you know. But it is an interesting thing to watch. You've seen it. I've seen it. Oh, so-and-so passed away. They left behind this. And now many of the people become vultures, and those vultures begin to circle. I've made a pact with myself. Never make somebody's life about stuff. There's a difference between having those icons of affection and reducing their memory to stuff. I've made the pact with myself that I'm not going to be that person, right? I remember somebody on the family tree passed away. I was just a kid. Everybody just loved each other until they realized, hey, wait a minute, there's some money in the bank here. The house is paid for, or we'll sell this, or who's got a, she's got a car. Well, which one of the kids will now get the car? Well, what about the other kids? They don't get a car. Oh, look, it's an album and jewelry, costume jewelry. I mean, I don't know what that stuff was. And I saw personalities change. Now, what causes that change? I think for some people, they have tendencies toward parasitic behavior where they just take, take, take. And that's kind of their thing. But I think there are other people who have assigned real value to those specific things that this person owned or hung on the wall or wore or whatever, and they are desperate not to lose it. They want a piece of that hanging in their house or sitting on their shelf or a part of their lives in some way so that they can look at it for years to come and feel real memory and affection. I totally get that. Today's broadcast is about grief, specifically grieving and the grieving process, not just the loss of someone through death, but I mean, grief comes in many forms. You grieve relationships, a marriage fails, or somebody moves away from you, or you are rejected by somebody you care about, your trust is betrayed. I mean, grief comes in a great many forms. I'm sure we'll probably end up gravitating back to grief and grieving the loss of someone who died, who passed away. I'm going to be speaking later on in the broadcast with a couple of licensed professional counselors, Mackenzie O'Mealy and Haley Twyman Brack. They've had a lot of these kinds of conversations. They have done a lot of work with recoveringfromreligion.org. I'm so thankful for their perspectives. We're just going to have a casual conversation. It's not like medical advice. This is not official counseling for the grieving, just perspectives from two people who are licensed professional counselors and can speak to the subject firsthand. They're going to be on the show in just a little bit. Also, I want to talk to you about your own experiences grieving without God. Area code 412. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Daniel in New York. Do you have any comments, questions, any thoughts? Yes. A question that I had regarding the whole thing is I'm no longer a believer. And I have, uh, in the military, it's not such an issue that I'm an atheist because there's plenty of others. But now that I'm retired from the military and I'm home and I've got friends and such and everything, and especially family that are, you know, I'm African-American and the church and such is such a huge part of our, our culture and especially our everyday life. Trying to be understanding to the grieving process that my believing family members, especially the older ones, has is kind of difficult because there's a performative sort of aspect to it. Because when we talk, it's like 
the whole time I'm on. So what are the kinds of things they're saying? He's in a better place. No, he's in the ground. He's right there. Or we're at the wake. And, no, no, he's right there. Yeah. He's talking about, you know, I mean, that sort of stuff. Or they start really going deep into, you know, all this metaphysical stuff. And they're supposed to make people feel better. The big problem was a lot of the people were hangers on. It's like they were showing up in order to get the score of some sort of moral brownie point. There were people who hadn't seen him in like 17 years. They were grieving, like they were acting as, you know, in, they were almost like the caricature of the church ladies who catch the Holy Ghost type of deal. And, okay, you guys are talking all this stuff, but he was calling people asking for help. You know, that's the reason he had a heart attack is because he couldn't deal with his medical bills, you know. And I was like, I literally gave him money and I was trying to help as best I could. But a lot of these people left feeling that they had fulfilled their pious, religious, metaphysical sort of obligation to his spirit. So, I mean, let's, if you were to fantasize about what you would have liked to say in the moment, like all bets are off, right? All protocols go by the wayside. And you saw all this. I'd have been like Martin, Martin Lawrence. I'd have, I'd have, like, the, you know, that TV show, I would have thrown them all out, including the preacher who did those platitudes and basically that indirect threat on behalf of God. He, he essentially called us heathen simply for not being as active in the church, even though literally none of us live near, near him. He doesn't know any of us. And how would he know whether or not for all he knew, we all just came from the seminary. But he just made the assumption. It was just this threat of you don't want it. You want to get by, right by God before. And that was like the theme of the wake. I know it sounds like a little bit of a cop out. I think it's situational. I've had instances where there are opportunities to have a conversation about a temporary life whenever we've lost someone and someone knows I'm an atheist. But if I see somebody else and I know that they are just pounding the God drum because that's all they got and, you know, the heartbreak is in the red zone and, you know, like this man's mother, et cetera, I myself would not engage at that moment. I certainly can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you that I relate and I understand and I'm glad he had you and I'm glad that you are living an authentic life, able to grieve with your feet rooted in the real world. And I appreciate you sharing your perspective, my friend. I appreciate it, Seth, and it was great hearing from you. I hope that uh, after this thing, I can um, maybe go to one of your lectures. It would be amazing. Oh, dude, it'd be nice to All shake right. your hand in person. I'm, I'm very sorry that you know for your loss, but just know that for as many platitudes as you have to endure, the rebuttals that you would like to give, know that you are not alone. A lot of us feel those same frustrations, and you know we'd like to have those conversations, and you never know. I mean, sometimes out of trauma or out of grief or out of... A heavy life circumstance, maybe other people come to a point where they start to question. They're looking for more, better answers when it comes to life and existence and the idea of the hereafter. You know, those opportunities do present themselves, and we should keep our eyes and ears open for them. I just think that uh, I'm maybe not for a lot of those people, maybe the ones that are close to my age, but within my family, I'm not the right person. Sometimes you're not the right conversation, and sometimes you're not the right person to to have someone really engage with that. And even if you are, they're not willing to actually go through the change of, or actually examination in front of you. And it's, they don't have to. And I respect that. I hear traffic so all I, around I you. That. Just wherever you are, be safe because we'd hate to lose you. Like, I don't want to end up at your funeral. All right. So No, I live in the suburbs. I live in Long Island, okay. uh, in New York. I heard somebody. I'm, I'm on my patio. Uh, oh, okay. I'm on my good. Patio. I was like, holy cow. You know, somebody had, like a semi truck just drove by. Man, I share your frustrations, but I appreciate the fact that you are an atheist in a foxhole. Thanks for your service. Thanks for calling this show, okay? No problem. You have a great one. Uh, See you later. I talked to Dr. Valerie Tirico on a show we did years ago about being at a funeral and somebody was talking about their dad and heaven and reuniting with everybody. And is that the appropriate time to have the conversation? And my first knee jerk was, of course not. People are grieving. Emotions are high. Don't be an opportunist. Don't do what the religious people do. And Dr. Tirico was actually like, well, you never know. There might be a circumstance in there where, 
you know, the opportunity for conversation presents itself. I mean, not people shouting, not everybody defending, but actually talking about life and death and everything before or after, if it exists, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, I'll never say never. I myself usually just grit my teeth, listen to all the gods speak, grieve and remember in my own way. Unless somebody crosses a boundary in some way, I just usually try to get by and get through. I don't know if that's the right or wrong answer. How do you deal? 336. Hi, you're on with Seth Andrews. Who's this? Hey, Seth. This is Jesse. How are you doing? Jesse, I'm good. We're talking about grieving without gods. What do you have for the broadcast? Gosh, well, I mean, I can kind of sympathize with your wife. I've got books on books on books of religion about Christianity, and I don't even believe in it, but they're my dad's. And so my dad passed away eight years ago. He had a massive heart attack, was not anything I was expecting. They called me. They said, hey, your dad's had a heart attack. You need to go to the hospital. So I went, I got my brother, and we got there, and they said, your dad's passed away. I was like, well, shit. <laughs> um. I guess I could say it's comforting, I guess, to have them, because at the time when he passed away, I was a professing Christian, but now I'm not, and now that I've been forced to out myself to my family as an atheist, they like to use him as emotional fodder, trying to convert me back to Christianity. For the books themselves, though, it's not about reading them, is it? It's like, it's just about having them. Yeah, and they, they literally just sit on a bookshelf. And every once in a while, I'll just look at him and be like, eh. I remember, you know, he would sit there and pour through them with all the questions he had about what his Bible said. And I mean, that's kind of part of the reason I'm an atheist today is because he had so many questions. Did you think that you would be reunited with him in heaven? You were still a believer at the time. Did you hold to that? Yeah. I mean, I remember saying to my pastor, I feel sorry for atheists because they'll never get to see their loved ones again. I remember saying that. And now, you know, the cards are reversed. And I'm thinking, well, I already don't see him now, but I don't necessarily grieve that. You know, I I got to be with him for 19 years and have nothing but good memories about him. You know, so that is something that, I'll hold on to until the day I die. I'm interested to hear about these tokens that we hold on to that sort of link us to the people that we've lost. And that's a great example. So other than that, you doing all right? Yeah, I mean, taking it one day at a time, um, dealing with the rest of my family who passive aggressively sends me messages about Jesus. <laughs> I got you. And I mean, I know, yeah, I know you understand that completely. And so it's, it kind of aggravates me quite a bit. You know, they hold that over my head, like, oh, you'll never see your dad again when you die. I'm like, <laughs> I don't see him now. And you using that as emotional, like ammunition for me to convert again. Like you don't even understand what your heaven is supposed to be like anyway. You will not recognize anyone. When you get to your theoretical heaven, you will be on your face worshiping some deity who's, in my opinion, an asshole. (laughs) Like, I don't want any part in that. I go back and forth when it comes to the families because I get that they're desperate. They do what they do usually because they really believe it. But is that an excuse for them to do awful and to be manipulative, right? And it's really not. Yeah, I don't don't guess they see themselves as being manipulative, but... I think ultimately they're terrified that you're going to burn in hell because they still believe in it. And the only, the only frustration I have really is, you know, the only reason my family believes in it is because that's what they've always been told. And I've asked them hundreds of times, why do you believe in it? What even gives you an inclination? This is true. Well, the Bible says so. I'm like, you can't do that. (laughs) You know what hell is? Hell is wasting these beautiful, precious, temporary moments being chained to an irrational fear of hell. I mean, that's what hell is. You waste your whole life thinking about death. I'm glad you escaped. You are among friends. Thanks for calling the show. Thanks, Seth. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. What's that line by Daniel Dennett? He said, there's no, I'm paraphrasing, but there's no kind way to tell someone else they've wasted their life. But there are a lot of people, they just sit around living life for death.
waiting for what's going to happen after they die. So they commit themselves to propagating these opinions and beliefs and indoctrinating children and taking missions trips and pounding on the door of their neighbors. It's all heaven and hell, heaven and hell, afterlife, afterlife. And I'm like, what about this life? And then they die at the age of 80. What have they done? Essentially, they they worshipped death and they lived the hell of worrying about hell. I just find that hugely ironic. My friend V. La Bianca, she was just on the show a few weeks ago. She's co-host of Talk Heathen and Secular Sexuality. Wrote a blog that came out in the fall of last year called Morning a Christian Parent as an Atheist Child. I'm reading it here with her permission. It said this, Where is Dad now? I asked my mom this week. We were sitting around her kitchen table a few days after he died by suicide. It wasn't a conversation I wanted to have, but it was the one I felt was important. I needed to know where she stood, and I honestly didn't know what she'd say. He's in heaven, she said after a short pause. He was mentally ill, but I think he really did love Jesus. God understood that. So you'll see him again? He'd abused her emotionally, verbally, and physically for 20 years. That won't make heaven lesser for you? I'll see him again, and he will be whole. It will be good. On the one hand, I cannot help but admire what a kind and forgiving person she is. To welcome her abuser into her image of a perfect afterlife is a feat of grace and empathy deserving of respect. It's a testament to her morality, superior to that of the religion she ascribes to, one which would label suicide a damnable sin. On the other hand, What do you think happened to him? My mom asked me after a minute. I think he ceased to exist, I said tentatively. There was a universe without him before, and there's a universe without him again. That seems so cold and horrible. I could never believe that. I believe human life is more valuable than that. And I think that it's more valuable because of it. We ascribe the most value to limited, finite things— I think life is so much more valuable because this is all we have, and then it's over. She paused. That's interesting. I'll have to give that some more thought. That entire exchange was the most my family and I talked about the theological implications of his death. They prayed once, graciously allowing me to remain outside the circle of joined hands. But other than that, we allowed each other to mourn with respect and support. It's more than I was expecting, and it's something for which I'm immensely grateful. Being involved in the grieving process with religious family members can be daunting, even if they are as understanding as mine have been. Never is there a more clear divide in perspective than when there's a death. Suddenly, all of these ontological discussions become immediately relevant to the conversation. What happens after we die? What doesn't? When I was first coming to grips with the news, I caught myself wishing, just for a second, that heaven existed and that he got there. For as long as I'd known him, he talked about how amazing it would be, how much he wanted to go there. He talked about it so much, I can't help but wonder if his belief in heaven was what persuaded him to end it. I'm not the only one who thinks this. He decided he didn't want to wait to meet God, was a phrase I heard a few times this week. I bit my tongue, because there, right fucking there, we find the insidious underbelly of this myth that is so shiny and appealing on the surface. Heaven is a great idea until you realize that it's a lie, and a deadly one at that. Would my dad have killed himself if he didn't think there was a heaven waiting for him? I don't know. I will never know. There was no note, no explanation, no final conversation. But knowing who he was, it's a real possibility. And that breaks my heart. 
The other insidious part of the heaven myth is its inverse, hell. I hadn't talked to my dad for five years. I'd cut him out of my life after helping the rest of my family run away in the middle of the night in the spring of 2015. Other siblings had tried to reach out and always regretted it. He would stalk us, demand to be let into our lives, and if we relented even a little, it would quickly spiral into the same narcissistic tactics of abuse. But I didn't need to talk to him to know he was living a miserable life. I'd heard enough from my mom, who needed to keep in touch with him for logistical reasons. He'd moved out of the family house and was renting a condo from his parents. He had no friends, no relationships, although he'd apparently posted on Facebook that he was looking for a new wife. He was sick, angry, and lonely. My only solace in this whole ordeal is the knowledge that he is no longer suffering. It's over. That person is no longer being tortured because they no longer exist. That burden has been lifted from the world, and everything in and around me breathes a sigh of relief because of it. If I believed in hell still, I know I'd be grappling with that question right now. I imagine certain family members are, even as I write this. It's nice to imagine that God would let everyone we know and care about into heaven. Hell is best reserved for those we don't know personally. But church doctrine is pretty clear about suicide, let alone the sins of abuse and false teaching he perpetrated for as long as I've known him. How would I be able to rectify that? How are they... I don't know if the lie of heaven ultimately pushed my dad over the edge into the act of suicide, but I do know that the lie of spiritual warfare contributed one of the biggest pieces of this horrible, twisted little puzzle. Dad was tortured by a black cloud, the family curse I'd been warned about as a kid. You'll feel it come over you, and you'll be very angry and sad. But it will always end, eventually, you just have to let it pass. Because for some reason, a demonic spiritual curse was easier to swallow for him than the idea of a clinical diagnosis of bipolar or depression. Neither were the fault of the sufferer, but I suppose it was heartening to imagine that one was suffering nobly for a spiritual cause, oppressed by a powerful enemy in the service of your king and overlord. To a narcissist, such a hero complex must have been irresistible. There was a grand purpose to it all. Not only that, it also promised a sudden, miraculous cure. Find the right words, the right prayer, the right motivation, and you're fixed. Perhaps God was just waiting for the right apology, a little more repentance, and the burden might be lifted. It was also more cost-effective than waiting for pills and therapy to fix things naturally. I could go on and on about the enabling of religion via poverty. His refusal to take any concrete steps toward help, or even admit that it was a problem that could be fixed by science, was directly responsible for driving the rest of his family away in an attempt to survive outside his abuse. If he'd gone on medication, if he'd gotten therapy, there's a very good chance none of this would have played out the way it did. When we did leave, he checked himself into a facility and started getting the help he needed, I was hopeful that once he got himself on the right track, we could reconnect. His parents checked him out again before he could benefit from treatment, convincing him that there was nothing medically wrong with him. It was just the black cloud. Again, if he'd gotten the help he needed, he'd probably still be alive. Suicide is only the end of one story. For the rest of us, it's only the beginning of a new and confusing chapter. I don't consider suicide to be a selfish act, but the pain of those left behind is real. Do I feel grief? Yes, but only for the memory of a father I no longer had anyway. Do I feel pain? Yes, but only for the fact that he must have suffered so much up until the moment of his death. Am I relieved? 
Yes, for a few reasons. I never have to worry about him finding out where I am and coming to confront me. I also never have to think about him alone and miserable again, something that pulled at my heart, even as I reaffirmed that I could not, for my own mental health, interact with him. My family is mourning in their own way. It involves heaven, a spiritual afterlife, a God who cares. And on the surface, that seems nice until you look a bit deeper, until you realize these lies are probably what caused his death in the first place, until you wonder who is next, what poor, desperate person is going to consider it more reasonable to cut their earthly life short than get the help they actually need. I've written in the past about how Christianity tortured my father. Now it's killed him. And I'm angry, not at him and not at the rest of my family, but I am angry. That said, and as angry as I am, I hoped that he saw that bright light as his brain was slowly depleted of oxygen. I hope he thought it was heaven before he ceased to exist. I hope his last thought was one of joy and peace. That was written on November the 9th of 2019, B. La Bianca, mourning a Christian parent as an atheist child. I've got 918. Oh, my hometown. Hi, right you're on here. the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Corey. What do you have for the broadcast? We're talking about grief without God. Yeah, about a year ago, I uh, actually this month, a year ago, I lost my great grandmother who was probably the closest person to me that I've ever had, that I've ever lost. It was a um, really hard time for me, and it was the first time I really, truly grieved. And at the same time, I was going through some health issues. I even had to cut out my family because I'd become aware of their toxicity because they are extremely religious, very right-wing so it, it became an even more compounded form of griefing on that. And I just went through some real hard times and uh, had a moment through some um, medical stuff where uh, last November, during some testing, my, uh, my heart actually stopped for a little bit. And it really brought back all of this. My great-grandmother, um, she was a devout, devout Christian, but she was what I would call the true Christian, the kind that would, um, I mean, there were strangers that showed up at her funeral to give testimony about her because that's the kind of woman she was. I, I didn't even realize the grief I was going through until spending time in quarantine and doing a lot of self-reflection. And one of the things that occurred to me was the fact that with me having that experience with, you know, near death experience of my own and just recently and everything, it was that moment of when Christians, when re anybody of religion dies or they're looking at death in a way, they're not even really examining death itself. They're examining this idea, this hope of what lays beyond death. And they never truly examine what it means to be dead so yeah in, in, in a way it feels like uh cheap to have religion you know my wife she's christian she uh, goes to or went to first baptist here in town she listened to you a lot whenever she was growing up on the radio you know me and her were having that discussion and i mean i looked at her and said you know that's something i envy you right now is this this idea that you can not have to face death, that there's something more than just an end. That was something whenever I gave up Christianity, gave up, you know, I finally admitted, hey, I, I don't believe in this. I realized I was giving up the security blanket. Sometimes it is true that people who aren't rooted in the real world, they never actually then deal with the real elements of love and loss and the life beyond. And I think what you say has merit. And I was also going to add on to uh, some of you, one of your earlier callers uh, said, uh, I think his, his name was Daniel. I uh, was talking about the funerals and the, how the, everybody else was talking about God and religion and all that. You know, of course, this was going on at my grandmother's funeral. 
But one of the things I had to remind myself was that a funeral is for the living and for the living to grieve. So every time somebody got up there and said she's in heaven or she's in a better place, I just reminded myself that they were there to grieve. And it's for the living, not for the dead. Well, you're among friends, man. I can definitely feel the goodwill in the chat as people are listening to your story. And and so for what it's worth, you're not alone. You are among friends and you are greatly appreciated. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, Corey. You too. 308. Hi. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Amanda. Amanda, let's talk. What are your thoughts? Well, going on after him is kind of hard because my story is very similar, actually. No, please tell me. My grandma passed away uh, just this last October. We found out in September that she had stage four pancreatic cancer. Would you have dealt better with it if you'd believed in heaven that you'd see her again, you think? No, I actually don't think so. Um, Since I've been so open and out about it and thinking this way since I was six years old, um, instead of just the praying and the hoping, we were there for her, cooking her last meals, in the hospital, spending the night for her last four nights of life, holding her hand for her last breaths. I washed her hair right after in the hospital bed. You're fine. Take your time. I think a lot of, oh, sorry. You're fine. (laughs) I think a lot of people with the uh, super religious backgrounds spend too much wasting their time with the hope and in the praying instead of the being there. That may be one of the key messages that needs to come out of this show. Don't waste the precious moments. This is all about our humanity, our shared humanity. Be there in the moments. And as far as heirlooms and taking stuff, I actually cut her hair for the last time. I'm a hairdresser. And uh, I kept some of that. And I've actually made little... uh, resin art pieces for the entire family that was close for after with her funeral flowers and her biological hair. I follow that Caitlin uh, Doty. I've followed her for many years and mourning jewelry has actually been a thing for centuries. It's a lost art of taking a personal hair from someone and turning it into art for something that was called mourning jewelry. I'm going to have to Google that. I'm going to look that up. Thanks for giving us the heads up on that. So, well, we're all hugging you right now. And I'm so glad you've got the memory of her with you and that you were there for her. That's huge. And appreciate your call to the broadcast. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. See you. I'm just sort of browsing Google here. Lots of different designs and Shapes and styles of mourning jewelry. I guess this is a tradition that's been around for hundreds of years. I wrote about a lot of different death traditions in my 2015 book, Sacred Cows. I don't remember the words mourning jewelry used like that, but uh, that's the term you can Google search and see some of what I'm seeing here on the computer monitor. Some very ornate rings. One has a skull on it. There's a heart, set of earrings, many pendants to be worn around the neck. There's a few that have places for portraits or photographs to go inside. Something you can peruse on your own if you're interested, you know. I love the idea, you know, finding a way to keep the person close, whatever that means to you. I know many other people have planted trees In honor of those they've lost, I think there's actually a way to have your body recycled as part of a tree planting. I mean, you are used to actually fertilize the tree. Some people make memory boards. Other people write letters to those they've lost just as a chance to express what they're thinking, not because they think that you know those who are lost are necessarily listening. We've seen people who have developed campaigns, supported various charities and causes given to organizations in the name of someone. There are crafts, there are pieces of art, there are special events. Highways have been adopted, you know, where you take a mile or two stretch of road and you pick up the litter and you maintain it in the name of a person. 
celebrations of the birthdays, lighting a candle, making memorial videos, going to specific places, perhaps a ceremony where the ashes are distributed, and then you can visit that place from time to time to remember. So many different ways of celebrating the life and participating in the sort of exercise of fond memory. We're taking plenty of time with this important topic. Let me take a very short break. I'll be back with a friend of mine who is an ex-Muslim activist who has been speaking recently about grief. Her name is Zara Kay. I'll have that conversation next. My patrons get this show without any commercials, and they also get the broadcast two days early. And I'm so thankful for your support at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Next up here, I'm going to talk to a friend of mine. Her name is Zara Kay. She is a Tanzanian-born ex-Muslim atheist. She's founder of Faithless Hijabi, which is an organization that works to support Muslim women who are questioning their faith or have chosen to leave Islam outright. Many of the people who are leaving their faith are going through a kind of of mourning or grieving. Many have lost mothers, fathers, siblings, friends, communities because they didn't tow the religious party line. Zara Kay joins me here. Hey, Zara. It's good to talk to you again. I said, nice, <laughs> nice to talk to you again. I associate the departure from religion with liberation. You know, it's I'm free, but you're speaking to something that we may not talk about enough of, which is it's almost like you are grieving the loss of a friend. If that has been your whole life, identity, community for years, even decades. Yeah. Initially, personally, when I had left religion, it felt good. It felt nice. It felt great. I felt freedom. And I remember going to a therapist, and he happened to be a Muslim psychiatrist. And he was basically somebody that said, even if you've let go of something awful, it could come with a lot of grief because there was a lot of your ego identity tied to it. Now you're exploring a life that doesn't have that dependency. So despite having a liberation, like a liberated life, I think there is, um, and this wasn't particularly as noticeable in my case, because for me, when I left Islam, or when I had accepted that I had left Islam, I wasn't praying, so I wasn't scared of God at that point. So, you know, being scared of God and leaving God happened gradually for me. But there are many other people for them, it happens all in one go. I mean, sure, it takes time, but it's always the fear of hellfire. And then understanding what the meaning of your life is without God and religion. And that if there isn't a God, what are you doing next? What happens after you die? And I think that all ties in with losing God. Coming out of that then, as their belief system has been so tied to their identity and they may be mourning or grieving what they've lost, do you have any steps that you recommend for them to take? Yeah, I mean, something that I went through personally, like with leaving religion and the grief of that identity, I always recommend looking for the answers well, one within and as cliche as that sounds, I think what I'm trying to say with that advice is always understanding how has your life changed practically because you've left religion. If for Muslim, Muslim women, if you're not wearing a hijab anymore, okay, great. And how does that change your life moving forward? Is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? And looking at each aspect of your life, be it finding meaning in your job or finding meaning in your relationship, and if that is tied into God, what's happening if you leave that idea of God? How does it affect your relationship? So I think separating it into smaller segments versus trying to figure out how and what your life is, is helpful like actually practically tearing it apart and understanding how am I impacted after leaving religion. For some mixed Muslims in the West, it is quite safe. And, you know, if you leave your families because you've left religion, that's a lot of trauma. And while it's related, I think it's important to identify that that grief isn't necessarily because 
It's without God. It's a grief induced by family members because of God. So I like looking at it practically and breaking it down into smaller segments and understanding what is actually changing as of today or like, what am I actually feeling right now? With the hope of maybe flipping the narrative to focus less on what you've lost and perhaps more on what you've gained, right? Yeah, that's also an option. Technically, I think a lot of times human beings are always wired to look at the worst scenarios instead of the best scenarios. And I think that's something we need to actively try and counter with each situation. But, you know, I think it can come really hard when somebody who's fresh out of religion and, you know, are looking at basically, in my case, being on death rows or asylum cases or running away from home. And it's really hard showing them the best scenario there until they're safe. And I think that's when the healing process begins and identifying, you know, I've lost my family, I've lost my safety, but I still feel freedom. Zara Kay, how do people find you in your work? Since I've got you on the line, let's do a shameless plug for Faithless Hijabi, okay? Yes, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram on Zara K, or my charity, which is now collecting funds to sponsor mental health programs for ex-Muslims in Muslim-majority countries. And we sponsor up to eight sessions. So any shout outs, any donations, any sharing or tagging would be really appreciated. That way we can get more people the right help. Necessary and important work. Zara K. always good to talk to you. Thanks so much for being a part of this conversation. Thank you for having me. Area code 423. Hi, you're on The Thinking Atheist. Who's this? This is Dale. Dale, we're talking about grieving without God or gods. Do you have a perspective or story for us? Uh, yeah, I have a, a little short story I'd like to share with you. I was once a believer, slowly over time lost that. Came out as full atheist about 20 years ago to all my friends and family. I have a particular aunt. She happens to be my favorite aunt, but uh, she's one of those Trump hung the moon, Fox News conservative Christians that you like to talk about. Yeah. Over the years, she would try to convince me to come back into the fold, as you like to say, and probably needlessly to say. It usually ended those conversations abruptly in frustration, but I was always nice about it. My father died in 2016, and this particular aunt and uncle dropped everything that they had and everything they were doing and drove eight hours to come stay with my mom while she went through her her own little personal hell, which I was absolutely grateful for. My aunt, my wife, and I went with my mom to the funeral home to help her get through all the paperwork that happens when somebody close to you dies. The funeral director had to go do something, paperwork or something, left us alone, at which point, my aunt says, well, God works in mysterious ways. And let me preface this next part by saying this was a really bad time for me. So I turned in her direction and looked her square in the eyes and said, fuck your God. Whoa. Yeah, let me tell you, that's a, a real quick way to end that kind of a conversation. But what, what did they do? What was the reaction? Well... There wasn't much of a reaction, but I could see her face turning blood red, and I'm not sure if it was from anger or embarrassment or if she thought lightning bolts were fixing the strike and she was too close. I'm not sure, but a couple hours later, we were back at the house, and I did apologize to her, and she said it was okay. I didn't say I was sorry, but I did apologize for being so crass. It felt good in the moment, though, right? I mean... Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, it's been four years, so that's now a funny moment in time. Yeah. But, yeah, and I've, I'm pretty sure at that moment I said it with all the demon hatred that I could summon. <laughs> well, I appreciate you calling and, and sort of telling your story. I'm sure we've fantasized, many people have fantasized about just blurting it out in that moment when somebody's throwing the platitudes at you. You just want to turn around and shake them and say all the things you're thinking, but usually don't say out loud. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, you know, I 
I didn't think about it. That's the thing. It just came out. And this woman had known for almost 20 years at that point that I didn't believe any of that nonsense. And for her to say that, it was just instantaneous, you know? Maybe that was part of your grieving process, you know, just get it out, throw it out into the yeah. open and let everybody know exactly how you feel, right? It's good to talk about your feelings, Dale, and that's exactly what you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Awesome. Thanks for sharing the story. Be safe out there, okay? Thank you, sir. 210. Hi. Who's this? Hi, this is Deb. Um, I've talked to you before, Seth, both on the line and in person. Hi, Deb. And you, you still have the most wonderful voice <laughs> on YouTube. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to make this quick. A couple things that I've heard. Now, I went through some massive grief in 2016. I lost my husband suddenly from an accidental opioid overdose. Three months later, I lost my father. So, yeah, I had to teach my mother how to be a, a widow. I lost four other adults in that same three-month period, and that was only the tip of the iceberg I had to deal with that year, okay? So, yeah, I, I know my fair share about grief. A couple things I'd like to say to some of the callers and listeners is check out Grief Beyond Belief on Facebook. It's a closed group. And it's really a wonderful area to go, and, you know, you can share your experiences. There, there's, there's a lot of people there who are in the same boat, who have been in the same boat, and a lot of very caring people. The moder moderators there are really, really good. So if you need a place to vent, to, to cry, um, to seek help, that's a great resource. Another great resource, I actually am one of the online counselors or advisors, we're not counselors, is recovering from religion. Not only does it help with grief from leaving your religion and how to deal with other people in your family who are still in the religion, there are a lot of resources there that are very helpful. There's a lot of people who answer the phone who most likely have been where you are. And there's also chat rooms that are dedicated to uh, certain aspects of secular life. Um, so th those are two resources I highly recommend for anybody going through this. Um, Seth, you're wonderful. Thank you so much for opening your lines to this sort of conversation. It's a real honor, you know, to be able to be a part of it. Those are great resources. What I really like about RFR, Recovering from Religion, is you don't have to even give your name. All right? You can be anonymous. They have an online chat yeah. function. So if you don't want to call, if you're too nervous about like you know doing it with a voice, you can just type. Uh, you, know, you yeah. sort of determine how you want that to look. And it's one of those things where you get to set the boundaries. And if you want the website... It is recoveringfromreligion.org. But I hugely appreciate the kind words. Thank you for that. One thing I found that helped me through, especially the grief of my husband's passing, was he did not want a funeral. And frankly, financially, I could not have afforded one at the time, so I had him cremated. But I bought some of that memorial jewelry he had three of his own children, three stepchildren, and I don't ha I didn't have any. So when I married him, it was like instant family, <laughs> which was great. But, you know, because I couldn't give his kids a grave site to go to, I gave them each one of those um, medallions with his cremains in them. And I can tell you that the kids were very, very appreciative of that. And I also sent some of his cremains to one of those companies that embed the cremains in a glass pendant. And I wore that pendant for a very long time. I've only fairly recently stopped wearing it, but it's, it's there on my dresser. And it was very comforting. And the, the style I chose, the cremains kind of sparkled like a galaxy. 
in the sky. And for my husband, he loved science. He loved cosmology. He loved sci-fi. And I thought that was a perfect tribute to him. That is lovely. You know, I mean, that's amazing. Some people were really turned off, but it's like, it's my grief. It's my process. Leave me alone. <laughs> and did it, and it helped, right? I mean, have you come to it the point now immensely. where you, it, it's, I mean, obviously there will always be a, some pain, but have yes. you come to a point yes. after this time where there's more fondness than pain? Are you starting to emerge out of that? I mean, you tell me how oh, much yeah. you want to talk about, but. Yeah, no, I started to emerge actually a year ago, May. And I started to become more openly atheist, more willing to embrace things that I always wanted to do. I took some art courses. I started working on my master's degree program. And I'm going to brag for a minute here. I'm working on my master's degree at Johns Hopkins University. Yes, that Johns Hopkins. Nice. Nice. (laughs) Uh, I've also become very involved with our local um, secular humanist group, FACT. And it's like last year I turned back on to life and turned on to being more interested in the communities around me, more willing to jump in and join things, hence RFR engagement. And I had started a local RFR chapter November last year, but with COVID, obviously that got shelved. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think but I am still on the chat line and the phone line whenever I can be there. Sometimes when we are reminded of the temporary nature of life, how critical the moments are. I mean, you said it. You got to turn back on to life. And I'm so glad yeah. you did. You inspire me. Can I give you one other little recommendation? Please and do. I am a little jealous of people who do get a diagnosis of a terminal disease. Because my husband died very suddenly. I woke up and he was on the floor not responding. And I had to do CPR for nine, I'm sorry, and call 911. He passed without regaining consciousness. If you get a diagnosis, please, either yourself or whoever has gotten it, please Spend time with that person, finding out what they truly like, their favorite music, their favorite book, their favorite things in life. It will help. Like I said, you know, he was my husband, and I could make educated guesses at a lot of things. But So am I hearing you right that one of the messages from your story is if you are given the bad news that someone's life will end soon, Perhaps you can also see that you have been given the opportunity to spend those moments and to properly say goodbye. Would that be a way to to phrase that? Yes. Yes. I'm sure it will be painful, but trust me, it's far worse if you can't do that. Hey, I'm I'm hugging you right now. And that's a lesson that I think all of us are learning right now. So if anything's come out of your situation, it's a reminder that you know, even the worst of news may give us the opportunity to have the connection, the human moments, to remember what's important. And if we are given the chance, the privilege of saying goodbye, we grab onto that and we hold it with everything we've got. And I think uh, yeah. you are speaking wisdom to us, and you are so greatly appreciated. <laughs> so you just, just know you're a huge part of the show today. You made a major difference, and I'm so thankful for you. Thanks for calling. Oh, thanks for having your, your format, Seth. It, it, it's wonderful to listen to. All right. Well, let's talk again, okay? You take right. care. Yeah, I got to go cry in my tea for a while. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. You take care of yourself. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Somebody reminded me of the uh, Richard Dawkins quote from Unweaving the Rainbow, where he said, We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will never in fact see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly, those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, 
scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. We, privileged few, who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. That's an interesting and I think salient take on life. Yeah, it's temporary. Yes, it's brief. Yes, it's fragile. But we made it, right? We're here. We are alive. We're drawing breath. We feel the sun on our faces for these decades on this planet. You know, we're going to die. Our loved ones are going to die. But we had each other. We had the chance to share life together, to interact, to be uniquely human for this moment on this planet, in this universe. I don't know. It's kind of a poetic way of re-looking at life and death. This broadcast, a conversation about grieving without God. I'm going to be speaking to a couple of licensed professional counselors in just a second to get their input. Now, this is not going to constitute like actual grief counseling. This is just a conversation, an informal conversation based on their experience of working with organizations like Recovering from Religion. I think you're going to, hopefully, anyway, you'll find it helpful. I received so many emails from listeners sharing their hearts in such transparent ways. I, there's no way, physically, there's no way to read them all, to share them all on the broadcast. I'd like to, but there's just no way. I mean, there were so many of them that came in. Just know this, if you shared your story, I read every single one of them, and I'm incredibly grateful for them. Just a few that arrived in my inbox. Lila said, when my grandmother died back in the 90s, we took several boxes of old photos that she'd collected through her life. At the reception, this was in a small town, and everyone still remembered her, so there was a lot of people there. We spread the photos out on the tables and told everyone to go through them and take what they wanted. There were so many people who found copies of pictures that they had lost or were damaged or that they just hadn't thought to keep. Young people would ask the older people, who is this? And then they'd get the story of how dad was a sailor or that's the girl I dated before I met your mother. We try to take photos in family history to funerals now. They prompt stories of good times. They help us remember the person we lost and even give the younger generation a perspective of that person that they may not have gotten while they were alive. I had a message in from Judith. She said that her brother had committed suicide and her family's Catholic faith brought into question this whole notion that her brother was being judged by God. Judith realized eight years ago she was an atheist since that time, she lost a grandmother, two uncles, an aunt, and a sister. Judith was sharing her grief, and she said, I sometimes wish that I could just believe, because if I did, there would be the possibility of seeing them again. But I can't. So what I've done is to find strength in the relationships I have and appreciate the small joys in life, laughing with friends and family, spending time with my pets, learning and growing. Despite all that I've been through, I wouldn't give up the painful growth and experience of loss and what it's taught me in my life. Pain and grief have allowed me to be more understanding of others. I want to help others to see the light of humanism, caring for others because you truly care and not because of the promise of glory and everlasting life. But I'm still scared. I still grieve the loss of the sense of community, especially during times of loss and uncertainty. Naomi said, I lost my father, who was a believer, two years ago. He'd been sick for a long time, and my family found him after he'd passed. I like to think I see him everywhere. His body will become the stars, the grass, the flowers I see. That has helped me immensely. Skip said, I've been a non-believer my whole life. I was lucky enough to have parents, especially my dad, who wanted us to think for ourselves, to gather evidence on any question and suss it out. I'm almost 60. I've lost all my aunts and uncles and both of my parents. 
I feel that grieving without religion is a much more personal and intimate thing. We had celebrations of life rather than funeral services for our parents. We shared stories and anecdotes, explained what they meant and how they touched us. Friends can get up and do the same. Conversely, I lost one of my best friends to a heart attack at 41 years old. His family was Catholic. While I respected their beliefs, I was angered at the -the fill-in-the-blank sermon that they had for him. Nothing at all about him and his life and his sense of humor. Nothing about his never-ending loyalty to friends and family. I've instructed my children that when my time comes to politely ask anyone who feels the need to ritualize my passing— to do it at home. I told them I will stand up and pull a Jacob Marley on their asses if anyone tries it. Anyway, that's my perspective. I'm sure I am not alone. And this story from Andrew, it just gave me goosebumps when I read it. He said, In 2016, I was dating and living with a person I thought I was going to marry. I was living with a beautiful woman. We had the dog, the gorgeous condo. I lived in a community where I was afforded the privilege of being a volunteer firefighter. Life came crashing down when, for the second time, I found out she was cheating on me. When she stated that she wanted out and that it was time to move on, I went from living the dream to living a nightmare. My world was ripped from under me. She even ditched me with her poor golden retriever before she left me for the man she was cheating with. I was destroyed. My mental health slid until I was unable to move forward. One day, I made a post on the Thinking Atheist fan page on Facebook. I don't remember everything I said. Just that I was thinking about suicide to end the immense pain I was feeling. I'd been left in a miserable pit of despair. To this day, one of the things about society's macro-level view on suicide is that we often view suicide as a cowardly escape— instead of desperate pain management. Even now, I remember that night, the night I made that post, the night your followers, your listeners, blew up my Facebook messages, telling me it was okay, telling me to seek help, telling me to do whatever it took to live. A few people even said that if I had to visit a church, so be it. I planned my suicide out that night to the finest detail. If I'd taken a left out of the parking lot at work toward the hardware store, I don't think there would have been any going back. Instead, I took a right, and I faced a hospital admission person, and I said, I'm thinking about suicide, and I'm really scared. I'm a veteran. I was a firefighter. I don't admit fear easily. I survived, Seth. And members of the community you founded even followed up with me over the next year. I made it. And it's 2020. I now own a house, met my future spouse, who's an upgrade in every sense of the word. And while I did have to move and leave firefighting behind, the future is bright. I don't know if you'll even read this. I'm sure you get swamped with thousands of emails. I just wanted to say thanks. Grief beyond belief is possible. Andy, I am floored and honored and just overwhelmed by that story. And I'm so grateful that you shared it. Thank you very much. I think one of the great privileges of founding a community is watching the community kind of take over, right? I mean, I didn't do this. This was good people doing good things, saying good words, being there. It was really you. I mean, you guys were there for Andy at this moment. You saw the post. You responded to the post. You were there as fellow human beings, as humanists, in a moment of crisis, and you probably saved his life. And I hear that story, and I just look around, and I just think, what an honor to be even a part of this, you know, to be a part of this. Uh, I, I don't know how else to say it, you know. You changed the world for this man, and his story is a testament to that. I certainly hope it encourages you if you're going through something and need to reach out. In just a second here, I'm going to be speaking with two licensed professional counselors 
who do a lot of work with recovering from religion and the Secular Therapy Project. Their names are Mackenzie O'Mealy and Haley Twyman Brack. And I think they have a lot to offer based on their experience in dealing with grief and grieving without the idea of gods and the supernatural and heaven and all of that. We're going to get their perspective and have a conversation on the other side of this. My special guests for this segment include Mackenzie O'Mealy. She is a licensed professional counselor. She works in my home state of Oklahoma. She provides outpatient counseling and continuing education training for clinicians. I've also got Haley Twyman Brack. She's a licensed professional counselor. Both are humanists. Both are advocates for human rights. Both have well, some experience in talking to people who are going through grief. Mackenzie and Haley, thank you so much for being on the broadcast. It's great to have you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Seth. We're excited to be here. So what do people say when they dial you or they call you or they speak to you one-on-one? They're in their various journeys, right? And everybody's journey is different, but there have to be trends. What do you hear when people are grieving and they reach out to you? And because this is audio, not video, and your voices are a little bit similar, I'm going to ask each of you to identify yourselves if I don't ask the question to you directly so the listeners know who we're talking about, okay? Right. Friends for too long. We yeah. sound too much alike. We do. Yeah. You sound like sisters or something. So <laughs> if somebody reaches out to you, you are seeing what? You're hearing what in those conversations? Yeah, this is Mackenzie. So my answer to that is it depends. It depends on their situation. It depends on the length of time between the initial loss and when they decide to reach out for help. It's just very different. In my own personal experience, most of the grief that I've treated is months later, sometimes years later. It's pretty rarely the initial aftermath of a loss. What do you think that's about? Are they not processing at first and they need time for the dust to settle? My personal opinion and this is just a guess based on my experience, is that when someone has a loss or a death, the world is expecting you to be hurting. And so in the first few months after a loss, you know, people are contacting you, you're getting that support. And then maybe after a few months, that support dwindles because people think that, you know, you can handle it on your own or they're busy with their own lives. So I think that's part of it is, you know, the initial response that we get after a loss fades, and then we're still struggling. That's interesting. At first, you're overwhelmed, right? They shower you with goodwill. What can we do? I mean, we grope for language, don't we, in these moments? If you need anything, please let me know, because we don't know what else to say. Right. And I think at some point, when we're supporting someone who's lost a loved one, it's really hard to know what to do and what to say. And so sometimes we put that on them. They, we say, you know, tell me how I can help. Tell me what I can do. And that does put a little bit of pressure on the grieving person to know how they need help because a lot of people don't. They're just, their answer is, I don't know. So, yeah, it's it's complicated. Haley, do you notice that? People are still sort of trying to figure out, what's my life even look like, right? I mean, they're navigating this brand new road, often in what they feel like is darkness, if you'll forgive the metaphor, right? And, you know, we, we have to remember, too, that grief is a normal human emotion, And so at first, you know, there's a lot to navigate. And like Mackenzie was saying, you know, at first you might have a lot of support. Um, You might have that network of people who are reaching out, trying to help you facilitate your emotions or get your needs met or just be there. But sometimes just the grief process, um, individuals are able to, you know, feel that sadness, feel that loss, feel that anxiety and process it and don't need further help. But some individuals, you know, after six, seven, eight, or even 12 months, if they still feel that that grief or the loss was so significant or severe or sudden that they do need help. And so for a lot of times, grief doesn't necessarily need counseling as an intervention. Do you feel like some people may lack the tool set for grief? I mean, there are some who they can be reflective and they can sort of navigate their own thoughts and feelings. And there are other people who may not be that, for lack of a better way of saying it, emotionally mature, or maybe they weren't given throughout their life the tools to be able to deal. They're just overwhelmed. They don't know what to do next. Have you seen that distinction? I've seen uh, the same individual process different 
deaths or different losses in different ways. And so it kind of depends. Like like Mackenzie said, it, it depends. And so, you know, some of us, maybe we haven't ever experienced grief until we were an adult. Like my husband, he didn't experience grief until he was in his 20s. And so it was a very different experience for him than me who has had uh, loss of grandparents and loss of loved ones from the age of, I remember my first funeral at age three. And so it really depends on the culture of the person, their family of origin. Some individuals uh, have supportive network growing up experiencing grief. Some do not. And grief or death is kind of a, a taboo. And so, you know, some individuals, like you said, don't necessarily have the tools to process that grief. And so that's kind of the role of therapists is to help to facilitate that, give them those tools. So that way they can process and grieve on their own because you don't necessarily need a therapist to do that. But sometimes that can help. You're both secular humanists, or that's how you identify. Do you feel like when people have these notions of heaven and afterlife, we're all going to be reunited and all God belief in some way, do you think that that helps the grieving or does it cheat them in some way? Do you have an opinion about that? So uh, this is Haley again. The research doesn't necessarily suggest that having a religion or identifying as religious is maladaptive in the grieving process. It doesn't necessarily cheat someone. It depends on the person. We know for some people, religion is a strength. I know the research suggests that being religious, identifying with a religion can decrease death anxiety or anxiety related to grief. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's better to have a religion. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's better to be atheist going through grief. It just means that whatever belief framework you're in, just having the tools and be able to make meaning based on your belief system or lack thereof. Mackenzie, did you have any thoughts on this one? Yes, the research doesn't show really much difference. What we do know from research is that having a religious affiliation does kind of provide a little bit of a buffer, sort of like a protective factor and helps you to cope with it a little bit better. But it's not necessarily the belief, it's the social systems that come with that belief. So as we know, with churches and religious groups, you have more availability of people around you who you can connect with and find support from. So that's really the only difference. But I think in a more broad sense, as we know, religion exists because of the fear of death and the afterlife. So one would think that a non-religious person would Based on that, they would have a bigger fear of the notion of death in the afterlife, or lack thereof. But we don't really know that. That's not and true for me, though. That's probably not true for you. I used to be more afraid of death mm -hmm. when I believed in heaven and God. Isn't that a weird thing? Yeah, and I, I would definitely agree with that personally. And I think part of that is these rules that you have to follow in religion. I grew up Church of Christ, so there was a set of rules, and you had to follow them. And if you diverged from them, then you were putting yourself at risk for an eternity. That's a lot of pressure. One thing about talking about death and grieving, it does reveal the utility of religion. I mean, I think it makes religion more understandable on a couple of levels. One, you mentioned the support structure, and I've seen you know, pastors who are on call 24-7 doing hospital visits, right? This is part of their ministry or what they do, where they have actual support groups like grieving ministries in their church comprised of human beings who do nothing but give counsel and comfort and hugs and care and food and whatever's needed. I mean, the church does do a really good job of providing structure and being there for people in those moments. And I think that has to be acknowledged, right? Yeah. And to add to that, another thing that religious organization or identification provides is a set of rituals that you don't have to think about. They just come along with the belief. And so there's plenty of research to show that rituals by themselves are very healing for grief. But someone who doesn't identify as religious doesn't really have the comfort of knowing what those rituals are. And so you have to get creative in therapy. You have to figure out what rituals do you want to create? What parts of your you know, history do you want to pluck out and continue using for your grieving process? So you have to get creative, but rituals are still definitely important. I think that's a huge part of it, isn't it? I mean, we look around and we see that having some way, some method, some framework for grieving. And it often involves being a part of the process. I was talking to Caitlin Doty, who is a mortician and author and educator about death, because, you know, there's a huge stigma about death here in the United States. But how people try to participate 
as a way through. I mean, even to the cremation process, there are some crematories where they allow a loved one to come into the room and press the button that starts the cremation. And for them, it's actually part of, and I'm not sure I like the word closure, <laughs> but for them, it, it helps to perhaps facilitate that. Has that been your experience? So this is Haley speaking. Both personally and professionally, I mean, you, you see in the religious and the non-religious individuals that we all kind of search for that, like you, like you said, for, back of, for lack of better terms, closure. And so you might see them reaching out for rituals. I mean, I, mean, I was raised in the Catholic faith. And so, you know, we had a whole ritual process. A funeral was like a three-day affair that ended with us all having dinner or uh, hanging out, drinking coffee and having cookies with the body in the room, which totally freaked out my husband the first time <laughs> went to a Catholic funeral. But I have had professors. So, for example, we had a, a professor who identified as atheist or secular. But whenever they experienced a death or, for example, whenever his, his dog passed away, he utilized pagan rituals. Not that he believed in, the, in a pagan faith. Not he, be, he believed he was actually you know, communicating with the deity or passing the animal spirit on to the next world. But just for him, it was that closure. It was he drank a bottle of mead and used uh, burned some of its fur in the fire or something like that. And so for him, it was just part of that closure, something that he did that helped him to signify the end of the life of that creature without a belief system. You know, we talk a little bit about pet grief. I used to apologize for that. Mackenzie and Haley, you know, I used to be like, well, pets. But of course, after last year, which we lost a couple in short order, I was doing some research because we were just devastated. You know, we, we, I don't know, it's, it, we, it was a harder loss than with some of the people that we had known. And we began sort of going through that process and realizing that this grief is just as real as any other grief. They're parts of your family. And, you know, we had them cremated. We had their ashes put into a candle. The candles have these little lights that come on, you know, at night for a few hours. And I don't know, it like it means nothing, but it means everything at the same time. Does that make any sense? Of course. And I'm so sorry for your losses. I know how much pain that brings. We sort of put it out there at the time and this community, you know, they all came together and we were all part of that process. And, you know, like one of our processes was to do a fundraiser, right? Something good needs to come out of this. That's probably a common thing. Somebody needs a purpose, right? They find themselves committing to doing something in the name of their loved one. You think about like memorial scholarships or you think about, um, like you said, fundraisers in honor of them. I mean, you went further than I did. Uh, whenever our pup passed away last year, I did a paint and palette and painted this picture for our mantle. Like, oh, that's lovely. That's as far as I went. <laughs> no, that's lovely. I, I think that is an amazing, I think it's important. It just helps you sort of put a punctuation mark on that. And, and then after a while, when the pain subsides, it becomes a little easier to dwell on the good memories instead of feeling that pain in your heart and in your gut. From your perspective, are there... Stages of grief. I hear this all the time. I mean, like, what stage of grief are they in? You know, it's denial, then anger, then you're bargaining, then depression, then you finally accept it. Is that just total crap? Are there <laughs> stages of grief? So this is Haley again. So the research suggests that there aren't just this linear stages of grief. Um, you know, we can experience acceptance, we can experience denial, we can experience anger, but there's no research to suggest that those are linear in nature. You know, sometimes I might use the stages of grief model to give clients a vocabulary, you know, like, what are you going through right now? What do you think you're feeling? But I'm not going to say to a client, oh, you're in the denial phase. Because I, I often think that, you know, the denial phase is more quote unquote phase, denial is more of that initial shock because even if you are expecting that a loved one's going to pass away or you know whenever you're going to have to put your beloved pet down, there's still that initial shock whenever it actually happens. And so it's not really a linear process. It's not really different stages. You can experience anger and denial at the same time. So basically, there's not a lot of research. Mackenzie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so there's no research to show that it's linear. Grief can be circular. It can be all over the place. It can go back and forth. And to tell clients that it's linear is really unfair to them. And so um, a metaphor that I use that I found online, you know, in cyber world a long time ago, I, I wish I could reference who, it, who made it up, but it's been really helpful for my clients. If you think of grief as a box and inside the box, there's a button and every time the button is pressed, it hurts. And there's a ball inside the box, and the ball is moving around constantly. 
And some things in your life make the ball bigger. So it's more liable to hit that button longer and more frequently. And different things make the ball bigger. But in general, it's stressors that make the ball bigger. So you may be years out of a loss and you move to a new town or you end a relationship or start a new relationship and suddenly you're grieving all over again. And that's because stressors cause that grief response to come back. And there's really no rhyme or reason. There's no explanation. But if we can release clients from this expectation that it's linear, it really takes away from that shame they can feel if they're grieving years later or decades later. Talking with two licensed professional counselors, they also are affiliated with the Secular Therapy Project, which is an offshoot of recovering from religion. Can you tell me from your perspective, is there an unhealthy way to grieve? You know, is there something that if you do this, you're actually going to be making it worse, amplifying the pain, maybe getting caught in a feedback loop of grief that you never get out of? I mean, what do you think about any of that? Whenever you experience long-term grief or complicated grief, we kind of get stuck in that rut. What we're really looking for whenever grief becomes, I don't know if we say it, a problem or grief becomes something that we're stuck in, is you start to see maladaptive behaviors. You start to see the avoidance of the trauma reminders. Like like you were saying earlier, whenever you make the memorial for your pet, or like I painted the, the picture, at first there is a lot of pain with the reminders. But after a while, after you've kind of grieved their death and processed your emotions, those reminders become comforting or to become things of joy. But where we see problematic grief is whenever those reminders after 12 months. So What the DSM says, after 12 months or so, if the grief reminders are still leading to avoidance, are still leading to those grief waves, as Mackenzie was talking about, those grief buttons, then that's when you start to see grief as more problematic. Just to echo what Haley was saying, the typical grieving process, and I use air quotes with the word typical because I think it's so restrictive, for adults is three to six months. I don't know about you, but that's really not a long time. Sometimes you get over the initial shock within six months and then you're able to grieve. So technically it's 12 months. If you're still grieving, you're still having trouble, then that's considered complicated bereavement. But the hallmarks that we're looking for as clinicians for an unhealthy grieving process is, like Haley said, maladaptive behaviors. So if you're not taking care of yourself, your relationships are suffering, you're not performing well at work or at home, sort of a typical mental illness presentation you know, within the first three months after a loss, that's kind of expected. But it's the length of time where you can't function for a year or even longer. Is there anything about the grief or grieving process that you know, or you've experienced, or you feel like we need to talk about that I haven't brought up yet? You know, are there any things that our listeners can benefit from that that you might be able to provide a perspective about? I just think the biggest thing to uh, highlight here is that grief is normal. Grief is a normal, healthy emotion. Um, You know, like McKinsey was saying, we look for complicated grief at 12 months. You know, that doesn't mean that, you know, two years later, you've processed the grief and all of a sudden you have a reminder and you start to become upset. It doesn't mean that you're experiencing complicated grief. I mean, that's normal. I think that the the biggest thing you want to focus on, that we focus on in treatment, is that growth at the end. You know, if we look at the Center for Complicated Grief has a, a guide for clinicians on Uh, how to treat grief um, in an evidence-based approach. And the final stage of that treatment is looking towards the future and facilitating that growth past it, whether that is by looking at your values. You know, grief, death, loss, it changes your life. And that grief can be anything from loss of job, loss of a spouse, loss uh, through miscarriage. And so it's just really identifying what life is going to look like post-grief and starting to make those goals for moving forward. It is an interesting sort of recentering time. You, you, people always say, well, it really makes you think of what's important, which becomes a cliche, but it's a cliche that also happens to be true. We see the fragility of life and the preciousness of the moments, and we're all on the clock. And, you know, it does have utility in that way to remind us, hey, I'm still here and I need to make the most of the moments as best I can. Yeah, this is McKenzie, and I'll just kind of weigh in on that. I think so. I think it really invites us to take a step back. And for a lot of people, that is just too overwhelming or too painful. Maybe you've never you've never been given the opportunity or never been challenged to look at your life that way. And I, I kind of wanted to add to what Haley was saying. There's Grief can come in so many forms. 
it can come in loss and death, obviously, but also it can come in loss of relationships. I think with breakups and family structures changing, divorce, and even just friendships changing, you're grieving that relationship. You can also grieve expectations. You know, you have an expectation for a situation or a relationship and it doesn't pan out. You you feel that sadness, you feel that frustration, and you're trying to put to words what you're feeling. And I think something that really helps clients in my experience is giving them that word. What you're experiencing looks like grief. And then they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You're grieving a loss of something. So I think to step back and take a look at our lives is a really special opportunity. And sometimes you need help doing that. So that's what it's kind of what we're we're there for. Before we finish up, I want to make sure we give some resources for the audience. Have you sort of had a love-hate relationship with Facebook memories? Like, you know, <laughs> like we lost our, our dogs last year, and I took, I don't know how many, hundreds of photos and videos. And the problem is, it's sort of a double-edged sword, because Facebook memories every other day has a photo or a video or a memory or a car ride or a dog park or something like that. And I find myself feeling, at the same time, this pang of pain and this overwhelming joy at the memory. Do you guys go through that? Like, do you just want to call Zuckerberg and say, hey, dude, <laughs> you know, can you just tone it down just a <laughs> Yes, absolutely. This is McKinsey. And it's interesting because being trained as a clinician, we didn't really get much direction on that. Social media is such uh, an impactful part of our lives. And I think this one part of it with the memories It is a huge piece of your grieving process because we work in rituals. We work in ways to process and remember and honor the person you lost or the relationship you lost. And then suddenly Facebook pops up with that shit and you're like, uh, I need to call my therapist. I didn't prepare for this. I'm not ready. Right. Or I I need I need to process before we do this. I get it. And I think another thing that that's really unique about grieving in this era is, I mean, more recent era is COVID. And the grief that we've seen in the last few months is so challenging. It really is because the rituals that we have as a culture, regardless of whether or not you believe in a deity, are, they were uprooted. Like we we can't grieve like we typically can. You can't touch, you can't hug, you can't Mm -hmm. physically embrace and be there for that person like you want to be. Exactly. And there's a biological, neurological healing aspect to physical touch for a lot of people, not for everyone, but we can't access that right now. And that is probably the hardest thing about losing someone this year is even if regardless of COVID, it's the rituals just aren't there and we can't access people like we typically can. There are some online resources. Can you give us those very quickly before we wrap it up? I want to make sure the listeners who want to go deeper, who might be experiencing grief or know someone who is, can sort of reach out and take this conversation further. Where would you send them? Absolutely. So there's a great, and, and I, Seth, I think you've talked with the people with Grief Beyond Belief, right? Yes, I have. Okay. So that's a good resource, griefbeyondbelief.org. They've got support networks, they've got stories, all kinds of things. But beyond that, Recovering From Religion, they have volunteers on the chat lines that are great. They're not clinicians, they're not therapists, but what they can do is refer you to the Secular Therapy Project, which is another resource under Recovering From Religion. Um, It's a database of evidence-based therapists like us who identify as secular or non-religious in some way provide evidence-based secular therapy. So that, I would say, is a good resource. You log in. It's very easy to use. Um, Yeah, and then Haley has a a couple more. FindCBT.org is also a database of evidence-based practitioners. Clients can easily find through that website. You just type in your zip code and kind of what you're going through, and you can scope them out from there. Uh, We also have a book that's really helpful for children, and this is an adorable book. And whether or not you are going through grief, it will pull at your heartstrings when you read it. But it is called I Miss You, A First Look at Death by Pat Thomas. And that's really helpful. Um, We've used it as young as age five in our practice. I took the liberty of putting Find CBT into the web browser as you were speaking. It says, Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. Is this just a vetting process to try to find a qualified secular therapist in your region? Yes. So 
clinicians do have to go through a vetting process in order to be listed. They have to prove or provide evidence that they are evidence-based clinicians. And they also have to be mindful about religion. So they're not going to push religion on you, just like the secular therapy project. You know, they're not going to push religion on you by any means. Because one, that's unethical. And two, that's not what a clinician should do anyway. I like the idea, you know, even if they hold a personal religious belief, they're not treating you by saying, well, you know, you just need more Jesus and you can get through this, <laughs> which is, you know, that's a whole other conversation. It's Triggered. <laughs> findcbt.org. You can go to seculartherapy.org, recoveringfromreligion.org. Licensed professional counselors, Mackenzie O'Mealy and Haley Twyman Brack. You've been so generous to be a part of this conversation. Your work is hugely appreciated. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. We appreciate it. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.